I'm telling you to leave. You, a woman who can only give birth to girls. The one glaring at me with utter contempt was my husband, Jake. I instinctively rubbed my belly. I had given birth to three daughters through this belly, in pain, for Jake. But what Jake really wanted was a son. I still remember how, after giving birth to our eldest and then our second daughter, he said, next time, it will be a boy. When our third daughter was born, Jake even left the naming all up to me. Ah, is this finally heading towards divorce? I felt like sighing. With a faint smile, my husband assured me not to worry about a successor. He said, there's already someone else who can bear him a son. My name is Susan and I am a full-time homemaker. I just turned 40. I live with my husband Jake and our three daughters. It has been three years since I gave birth to our third daughter. This month, I have decided to quit being a homemaker and go to work. It's because on Jake's salary alone, we couldn't afford to provide lessons for our two older daughters. I decided to work for the sake of our three children. Fortunately, I found a job quickly, and now I am managing to cover our household expenses while working. Lately, Jake has been complaining more and more about how his parents are getting older, and that I should be the one to take care of them. He even suggested that I quit my job to look after them. But, that's out of the question right now. Why? We can live comfortably enough on just my salary if we don't splurge. Splurge? I've never done that. I'm working because your paycheck alone won't cover extracurricular activities for the kids. They don't need any extracurriculars. It's perfectly fine if they don't learn anything extra. This is the kind of nagging I always get from Jake. That's why I've learned to just brush it off whenever he brings it up. Are you even listening, Susan? He asked. I hear you, and I'll do what I can to help out. Honestly, I can't stand my in-laws. I genuinely don't want to help with their care. But Jake and I live near his parents' place. It was his idea to start our married life in an apartment close to them. At the time, I didn't know their true colors and thought it would be convenient for me too, naively saying that it would be helpful. But it didn't take long for me to see their true nature. About six months into our marriage, my mother-in-law asked me to help clear space for a big table she bought so we could all gather anytime. That's when I started helping out at their house. I found myself constantly being bossed around by my in-laws, being told where to put things, to tidy up, to serve tea, like some kind of servant. Being newly married, I couldn't handle it well, and just kept helping, as they told me to. Because of that, each time I visited their house, they treated me worse and worse. Every visit, I was like a little maid, having to listen to the in-laws boast about the old days or complain about their struggles for what felt like hours. And then, they'd end up meddling in our private life, pressing us to quickly produce a male heir. Even my husband, who said he wanted kids, would say things like, Of course I'd prefer a boy. Actually, if it's not a boy, there's no point in having one. When I was pregnant, all they cared about was the baby's gender. When they found out our first child was a girl, they insulted me and said things like, Well, there's a saying, first a girl, then a boy. She'll be handy to have around. When the second and third turned out to be girls, too, the in-laws openly lost interest in them. They just keep saying next time, make sure it's a boy. Why is this house such a mess? There are no rowdy boys running around and yet you use being busy as an excuse. Can't you even clean properly? Maybe it's your laziness that's preventing you from having a boy. All these girls and all they'll do is get married off elsewhere. They can't be successors. You should be taking care of us, the heads of the family, instead of wasting time on girls who are of no use as heirs. To think these are their own grandkids they're talking about. I never invited them in the first place, and I certainly don't want to go to their place. Being dragged to their house and treated like this is more than I can stand. I've told Jake countless times that I want to keep our distance from his parents, but it's like talking to a wall. The house being a mess is a fact. Girls are supposed to play quietly and read books, right? Instead, they just scatter their stuff everywhere. If you can't manage housework and childcare, which are supposed to be a woman's job, then it's no wonder you're being criticized. How can you say that when we're both working to raise our two kids? 
It's impossible for housework and childcare to be solely my responsibility. If working is your excuse, then just quit and be a stay-at-home mom. If you can't do that, then what my mother is saying is right. Do you really think you can support me and our three daughters on your salary alone? That's why I'm working too. It gives me a headache just thinking about it. Sure, there was a time when men worked and women took care of the home and kids, but those days are long gone. Now it's normal for wives to work too, but to accept the changing times, while still insisting that housework and childcare are solely a wife's responsibilities, is just too convenient. No matter how much I try to convince him, Jake just won't change. My mom is right. It must be as my dad says. Every time I hear these words, thoughts of divorce cross my mind. But my daughters, oblivious to everything, my daughters were fond of Jake. However, the eldest, a middle schooler, seemed to have some reservations about him. Being in the throes of adolescence, she didn't seem to be very interactive with Jake. Yet, whenever I saw the third girl innocently laughing and clamoring to be held by Jake, calling him daddy, I couldn't bring myself to go through with a divorce. Three months had passed since then. For some reason, Jake started coming home late more frequently. I was suspicious and asked him when he returned home. Jake, you've been quite late recently. Is something up at work? No, it just happened today. A junior messed up and I had to cover some overtime. Don't worry about it. At first, I believed his words, but he began to come home late more often, and I asked again. Then, Jake started making excuses, like he was held up at work entertaining clients, or meetings with partners ran long. Even as I started to suspect Jake's words and actions, I couldn't muster the courage to take that step away, because I didn't want to deprive my children of their beloved father. I started to pretend not to care about Jake's late returns. Half a year had gone by in this way. A colleague I worked with mentioned seeing Jake walking in the downtown area with a young woman. I dismissed it, saying Jake was at work, but she insisted she wasn't mistaken. Our families are close, often going camping or having barbecues together on holidays, and my daughters are around the same age as hers. Jake and she always got along well whenever they met. So I knew she couldn't have mistaken someone else for Jake. But even knowing this, my desire to trust Jake was stronger and her suggestion to approach him next time made my heart skip a beat. I told her I'd talk to Jake about it, hoping it was just a misunderstanding. I went to see a private investigator immediately after work and requested a surveillance operation. Five days later, the investigator got back to me, saying it had been quite straightforward. When I met the investigator after work, I was presented with substantial evidence. There were several photos of Jake entering a hotel with another woman, and the results were incriminating. I decided to confront Jake about the affair as soon as I got home. Though he had gotten home before me, he was just looking at his phone in the living room. I saw my eldest daughter take her younger sisters to her room. And while I felt sorry, I couldn't keep it to myself. Jake, can you explain this to me? You said you were working overtime or entertaining, but is entertaining clients at a hotel part of the job? Jake didn't respond to my words and just started making a phone call with a cold expression. For some reason, Jake remained silent, determined not to speak. So your silence means you admit it's true? It's none of your business. Do you really think a husband's affair is none of his wife's business? None of your business. No matter how many times I asked, Jake only repeated that it was none of my business. Then suddenly the doorbell rang. While I was thinking of pretending we weren't home, Jake quickly went to open the door. In came my in-laws and the woman from the investigator's photos. What's going on? Did you call them here? I hadn't planned on telling the truth until everyone arrived. Well, now that everyone's here, explain these photos. I challenged Jake again with the photos. The girl in the photo is pregnant with a boy. Our family has always needed a son to carry on the family line. I told you before we got married that we needed a son. But you kept having girls. So, you're no longer needed, and should leave right away. Just when I thought Jake was starting to make sense, he handed me divorce papers with an explanation that didn't make any sense. Hold on, pregnant? How many affairs do you need to have for that to happen? Sure, I knew about the son issue, but we can't choose the gender of our babies. Besides, you always seem to love our daughters. 
Susan, you've read the story, but you're someone who could only have girls. Just leave this house quietly. I'm sorry, but I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to my husband, Jake. What's going on? As I pressed Jake for answers, my in-laws interjected. That's enough. We're finally having the boy we always wanted. It's best for you, who couldn't do anything, to leave. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to you, Jake. So why did both of you come barging in? Don't try to change the subject. At my words, my husband let out a heavy sigh. Ah, enough already. There's no need to discuss this. All Susan has to do is leave this house quietly. What are you saying? We have three daughters. And you know as well as I do that it's impossible for me to support all three with my current income, right, Jake? That's none of my business. You're the one who wanted to have three girls. Just get out already. Don't be ridiculous. What do you mean, wanted? You used to dote on all three of them too, didn't you, Jake? Why would you say something like this all of a sudden? I thought my husband would say something in response to my words. But it was his mistress who retorted. Oh, this is why dealing with an older woman is such a hassle. When you're told to leave, you should just leave. Gracefully. What are you even doing here? It's because of you showing up that our family is in this mess. Mess? Don't you mean it's your fault for not being able to have a boy? The mistress sneers at me with a snort. I painfully realize that I've expected too much from my husband. We have three kids and our youngest adores her dad, so I wanted to believe that divorce isn't the only right answer. I thought he would think of the children when faced with the evidence. Even if he didn't have a change of heart, and we couldn't be a happy family, I believed he would at least act the part of a good father in front of the kids. But in reality, he shamelessly brings home not just his parents, but even his mistress. I understand. I'll file for divorce. I was too naive. That's, that's what I realize as I stand up to pack my things. I had thoughts about the mistress smirking as she watched, but I didn't care anymore. I snatched the divorce papers from my husband, and sign them. I write my name as the guardian for our daughters. I'm taking custody of all three girls. I'll be filing for alimony and child support later. I'm leaving now, but I'll come back for the things I can't take with me today. Do whatever you want. My in-laws, who usually make snide remarks, listen to our conversation with dissatisfied expressions. It seems that they've left this discussion up to my husband. Knowing this, my husband confidently tells me off. Feeling the tense atmosphere, I hug my eldest daughter, who has been cautiously observing from the room. Maybe she understood just from that, because she immediately started packing her things. The middle and youngest daughters, thinking they are going on an outing, cheerfully prepare their to-go bags. Even as we gather our bare essentials and head for the front door, no one comes out from the living room. The middle and youngest daughters look puzzled, but when they wave goodbye cheerfully, they leave the house in high spirits. I call my parents' house. I haven't been home much since I moved far away after getting married. Despite the sudden call, my mother tells me to come back as soon as I can. They offer to pick us up, so we decide to stay in a hotel for the night. There, without telling my daughters about their father's affair, I explain, Daddy and Mommy are just heading down different paths now. The younger two who love idols recall a recently disbanded group who had said the same thing. Does that mean we can't be together anymore? It seems my eldest understands what I'm saying. I return to my parents' home, with my daughters, and we are swamped with changing our family registry and various other legal and administrative processes. And before I know it, two months have passed, and I successfully received alimony and child support for my husband and his mistress. I had filed for compensation for the affair against both, and additionally, for child support from my husband. Not wanting to see their faces ever again, I conducted everything through a lawyer. Everything went through a lawyer. It cost money, but it was worth it to avoid the stress. The lawyer's visit to my in-laws to discuss alimony and child support was met with their silent bitterness, as if they were swallowing a bitter pill. Despite this, my husband had an affair and even got another woman pregnant, which looked bad to outsiders. In order to prevent further complications, both my husband and my in-laws hastily gathered the funds for payment. It seems they even covered the mistress's portion of the alimony. Another three months went by. While we couldn't afford luxuries, 
My parents supported us, and the six of us were able to start living a peaceful life together. I was just beginning to get used to life without my husband, as were our daughters. On his day off my husband suddenly called me. When I ignored him the phone kept ringing over and over. I thought it would be troublesome if it kept ringing until our daughters returned from their lessons. So I reluctantly decided to answer my husband's call. Good, you finally picked up. What do you want all of a sudden? I responded coldly. Well you see the woman I cheated with just gave birth. What am I supposed to say to that? I was about to hang up coldly when my husband suddenly raised his voice. The legs. I mean the crotch. According to my husband, the child that his mistress had given birth to was a girl. Moreover, it wasn't a case of a mix-up during the ultrasound. The doctors had been saying it was a girl from the start. The mistress had lied about the baby's sex because she wanted to marry my husband, who apparently would have considered divorce if it weren't a boy. However, his parents put a stop to that. They were worried about not having any grandchildren if things continued as they were, so my husband called off the divorce. He was supposed to be thinking about having another child right away, but his life was in shambles and he couldn't focus on that. Right after the birth she couldn't work and had no income. She refused to do housework perfectly because of child rearing and she flatly denied doing any caregiving for my in-laws. Of course, if you're living with a baby who may or may not have a steady head yet, it's gonna be like that. It's tough to take care of household chores perfectly when you're desperate with a baby and you don't have the physical strength or spare energy to take care of elderly parents. Yet, living with this new wife, my husband now told me he was thinking of divorce again. So, what do you want me to do about it? I responded coldly. My husband said, Susan, please, can't we start over? I responded, huh? As if I have any intention of getting back together with you now. I lashed out at him. Don't talk like that. Despite having thorns like a rose, you're delicate and bloom beautifully, aren't you? I love that about you, Susan. Let's give it another try. My husband was trying to hold me. My husband was trying to hold me back with his poetic words. Those words gave me chills. Susan, are you listening? We've been together for a long time. Have your feelings changed just because we've been apart for a bit? Perhaps I would have been moved by my husband's words of love if this were back when we were married. But after discovering his affair and getting a divorce, all I could feel was coldness. I just gave a bitter smile. You're smiling, so that means you forgive me, right? My husband happily misunderstood. Ta? You're totally clueless? That was a bitter smile. I'm not laughing, and I haven't forgiven you. Why do you have to say that? Susan, please consider getting back together. Haven't we always been doing well? You were happy with me, weren't you? We were not doing well, that's why we fought so many times. I wasn't happy, that's why I divorced you. It was you who said you didn't need me. That's true, right? Then we can start over. It was me who suggested we break up, so I'm suggesting we start over. Let's do it. My husband started spouting nonsense about wanting to reconcile. He even brought up old times, and honestly, I was fed up. But then, a thought struck me, and I changed the subject. Oh, about Kate. Why do you know her name? She didn't introduce herself that time, did she? Hi. My husband sounded surprised when I mentioned the name of my remarriage partner. Of course I know. I heard it from the detective, and I even sent a certified mail for the alimony claim. And about her? What about Kate? I was just wondering who she might be targeting next. She has a hobby of breaking up seemingly happy couples or married people, and since you and I are divorced, I was wondering who the next target is. My husband said nothing. Perhaps he was speechless. Mouth agape. I proceeded to explain to my unresponsive husband what I knew about this woman named Kate. Kate had always been adorable since she was a child, always surrounded by various people. Her father, the company president, doted on her, and she was spoiled, always getting what she wanted. It's pre precisely because she could get anything she wanted that taking things from others became her hobby. As an adult, her targets became other people's boyfriends, fiancés, and husbands. Since taking things was her hobby, she would easily discard them once she managed to start a relationship. When I introduced her dating history, investigated by a detective, to Jake, he gasped in a strangled voice. 
What the heck? Why bring this up now? If you told me this when we were getting divorced, I wouldn't be in this mess. Back then, all you said was, get out. You never listened to my side of the story. So I did as I was told and left. It's not like a woman who approaches a married man can be considered good-hearted. Don't talk like that. Susan, it's so sneaky of you, making it sound like it's my fault. If you had just explained things properly back then, it would have been different. Jake, for some reason, started to speak in a defeated tone, playing the victim when he spoke to me. Angered by his words, I snapped at him. What are you on about? You're the one in the wrong, not like you are wrong. Why don't you just live however you want? I don't care anymore. At my words, Jake suddenly spoke in a softer tone. Susan, it's gonna be tough, raising three daughters, all by yourself. Let me take at least one of them. If you let me take one, you'll have an easier time. Aren't two kids enough? The cloying sweetness in his voice was so vile, it made my head spin. What in the world does he think of our daughters? I could never send them to live with such a man. Neither Jake nor his parents really want the girls because they love them. He kept saying any girl would do, or just one, talking about them as if they were people. I could only see a future where they would be preyed upon by Jake and his parents. I knew that as they grew up, they would receive the same terrible treatment I did. That's why I refused adamantly. Don't be ridiculous. I will raise my daughters properly. Don't be like that. A child needs her father, don't you think? Jake argued defiantly. A father who can't even raise his kids properly, let alone cheats, has no right to custody. I spoke firmly to leave no room for misunderstanding. Even so, it's up to the girls to decide if they want a father like that. They're too young to decide for themselves now, so I'll take responsibility and... raise them. Enraged, I conveyed my feelings and hung up the phone on Jake. I don't know if it was because I immediately blocked his number, but I never heard from him again. Months went by. It seems Jake and Kate's divorce went through without a hitch. Kate went back home with her newborn child. Apparently, the child's father is also married, and she is being sued for alimony not just by Jake, but also by his actual wife. Strapped for cash, she seems to be working hard at raising her child with the support of her parents back home. Terrifyingly, she shows no signs of remorse. She is aware that what she's doing is wrong, and if caught, she pays alimony as a sign of her sincerity. However, it seems that the money is also being provided by her father, who is a company president, allowing her to live a carefree life. It appears that the reason Kate went after my husband was just a whim. With her natural beauty and status, she would freely take other women's boyfriends and married men, and she decided to target married men as her next conquest. It just so happened that Kate set her sights on Jake and me when she saw us in town, it was a complete nuisance to have our lives disrupted by her caprice. And the reason Kate decided to marry Jake, something she usually didn't bother with after taking a man, was because Jake was indecisive and indulgent towards her. It seems Kate wanted a man who would treat her like a princess, indulging her every whim and buying her whatever she desired. Now I couldn't care less about it all. I was stunned by the sheer audacity of not just my easily swayed husband, but also Kate the woman he cheated with. My husband Jake was deceived by his affair partner, but he had the chance to refuse and didn't take the bait. No matter what stories I hear, the fact that Jake betrayed me won't just disappear. I also heard that Jake's family was ostracized by friends and relatives and had moved far away. They only stormed into my house once after the move. Susan, stop being stubborn and hand over one of the kids. That's right, Susan. It's not good for a child to receive all the love from just one parent. We'll raise her together, the three of us. Please stop. I'm fine raising her on my own. Thinking that my youngest daughter, who was still too young to understand, would be okay, the three of them came with a menacing look to take her away, and I resisted desperately. You can't handle it, Susan. You can't raise her while working. Hand her over, Susan. Poor thing. Don't worry. We'll raise her properly. No matter what I said, they wouldn't listen. Stop. Don't take her. This is kidnapping. My youngest daughter cried loudly and I screamed just as loudly. Thanks to our cries, the nearby residents gathered and quickly restrained the three of them. After a while, 
the police arrived from a call and took the three away. I repeatedly thanked my neighbors, relieved that my daughter was safe. Later, the three of them received a restraining order. But I'm considering moving because a restraining order isn't enough to make me feel safe. Since they know well, where we live, it wouldn't be strange for them to show up at any time. I've discussed moving with my parents, who live with us, because I feel sorry for them too. They said they'd dispose of the house and move with us, as it would be a nuisance to be followed forever. Still, I feel guilty for changing my daughter's environment so often, yet seeing their smiling faces and healthy growth heals me. I've decided to move to a new place to protect them. Just before moving, I received a call from an unregistered number. Assuming it was the moving company or someone from the city office, I answered, only to discover it was surprisingly Kate. Summing up her sobbing story, she had apparently gotten into trouble for being with too many men and had contracted a serious disease. She pleaded for money for treatment and demanded that I return the alimony, but I responded coldly. Don't you have a wonderful dad who buys you everything? I asked, there's nothing I need to do for you. Her audacity was too much and without much of a response, I simply hung up. I immediately blocked her number and purchased a new cell phone, ensuring she could no longer reach me. I am grateful to my parents for accompanying me during the move, and I am determined to continue working hard for my daughter's healthy upbringing. How dare you? With those words from my mother-in-law, I was kicked out of the house. My mother-in-law Patricia had been injured and was urgently taken to the hospital. I had rushed there with my husband Mark, only to be suddenly confronted with such an accusation. All eyes, including those of my husband and father-in-law Bill, turned to me. And so I was expelled from the family for an unfounded crime. But I had no memory of doing anything wrong. Later, with advice from a certain individual, I realized there was a shocking truth about Patricia. My name is Sarah. I am a 37-year-old housewife. I have been a housewife since I married Mark 10 years ago. I don't have many friends, so I mostly stay at home. Mark and I have been dating since college and decided to get married a while after we both started working. A few years ago, we started living with my father-in-law Bill and mother-in-law Patricia. Originally, we wanted to have children and decided against living together, considering the kids. However, we found out we had trouble conceiving. We tried infertility treatments desperately but were unable to have a child. Continuing the treatments would not only be expensive but also mentally stressful, so we made the decision not to have children. That's when talks about living with my in-laws began. Honestly, I wasn't too keen on the idea, but my in-laws didn't seem like bad people, so I thought maybe living with them might be okay. We began living together on the condition that Mark would always have my back. Considering the age of Patricia and Bill, I took on most of the household chores. I would wake up at 5 a.m. adjusting to their schedule and make breakfast. Lunch was made according to their individual schedules. I did the cleaning daily and sometimes even drove them to the hospital when I had some spare time. I did my best for my in-laws and I believed our relationship was not that bad. However, one day I overheard a conversation between Patricia and Bill. That day, I had plans to have lunch with a friend, so I made lunch for my in-laws early and left the house. I was enjoying lunch at a cafe with my friend, but she had to leave early because her daughter got a fever. As a result, I ended up parting ways with my friend a few hours earlier than we had originally planned. I thought about making a detour somewhere, but I just did my grocery shopping for dinner and headed straight home. I figured my elderly in-laws would feel more at ease if I was home. After finishing shopping, I opened the front door and headed for the living room. There's a hallway leading to the living room, and my in-laws' bedroom is off of it. Wait, I heard them conversing as I walked by. They usually keep their door completely shut, but that day it was slightly ajar, allowing their conversation to filter out. I wasn't initially curious about their conversation, but the moment I was about to walk past, I heard my name. Intrigued, I wanted to know what they were discussing. Leaning close to the door, I was met with a barrage of shocking words. Sarah's out having lunch with her friend again. She did the same just recently. Despite being a full-time homemaker, she lives a carefree life. 
Without Mark, she wouldn't be able to maintain that lifestyle. Well, maybe Sarah just needs a break every once in a while. But I do feel it's unfair. We can't dine out because of our health, yet she goes out all the time on her own. Exactly. Why did he marry her? I wished he had married the one he was dating before. Besides, Sarah has a rather unrefined side. Her cooking isn't great either. I discovered that, especially my mother-in-law had a negative perception of me. I had never heard such comments directly, and Mark had never mentioned that his parents disliked me. So this was my first time realizing that they did. Knowing they disliked me made interactions with them somewhat awkward. Of course, I continued with my usual chores and tasks, but the conversations between us started dwindling. It was hard to confide in Mark, and if I did, confronting the in-laws would likely lead to denial, making my case harder. As I pondered what to do next, things took a worse turn. My mother-in-law's cherished necklace went missing. And shockingly, she blamed it on me. She demanded a search of my room and to prove my innocence, I complied. Though I was certain I hadn't taken it, Patricia's necklace mysteriously emerged from a drawer containing my jewelry. See, I knew it was her. She always eyed my necklace with envy. I bet she's taken other things, too. With that, Mark and my father-in-law frantically searched my room. In the end, only the necklace was found. I was left standing in the middle of the room. Feeling ostracized from that day on, I was treated like a thief and distanced by the family. They wouldn't listen to any of my explanations. To make matters worse, my mother-in-law was spreading nasty rumors about me throughout the neighborhood. That woman stole my necklace. Can you believe it? And she keeps denying it, even though it was found in her room. Given the talk, every time I left the house, I was met with cold stares. Life went on this way for a while, and being home became increasingly uncomfortable. Usually I would stay home, engage in my hobby of crafting, and converse with my in-laws. However, lately I had been spending more time outside. After preparing breakfast for the in-laws in the morning, I would head out. I would kill time at diners or comic book stores until Mark returned from work. One day, I received a call from Mark informing me that his mother had been urgently hospitalized. Where are you? Mark asked. Mom fell down some stairs at a pedestrian bridge and got injured. Please come to the nearest hospital from the house. Dad and I will be with Mom, he said hurriedly before hanging up. I happened to be close to the hospital at that moment, so it only took me about five minutes to get there on foot. After quickly finishing up some errands, I walked briskly to the hospital where I heard my mother-in-law had been taken. I asked a nurse which room she was in, and as I headed to the room, I had an ominous feeling. When I opened the door, everyone present turned to look at me simultaneously. Their gazes were sharp and hostile, like they were looking at a villain. I thought my bad feeling might be right. Then my mother-in-law pointed at me and shouted, How dare you! When I asked what was going on, she exclaimed, Don't play dumb. You pushed me down the stairs. When I was walking over the pedestrian bridge near the house, I felt someone push me from behind. It hurt so much when I fell, but with the last of my strength I looked up and there you were. You vanished before others gathered, but I'm sure it was you. No. I didn't. I tried to explain, but my husband and father-in-law interrupted. I never thought you'd be capable of such a thing. Just leave our home. I agree. This is for the best. You two had issues before. It's better if you live separately, my father-in-law added. That's right. Just leave. You're not family, my mother-in-law chimed in. And Mark, you should divorce her, she continued. Yeah, I'm going to, Mark said. Without being able to defend myself, it was decided that we would divorce, and I would be ousted from the family. Leaving the hospital before my husband and father-in-law, I felt lost. I never imagined things would turn out this way, and my parents lived far away. It would take a lot of effort to move my belongings there. Moreover, my parents were strict, and I didn't know what they would say if I told them I was divorcing. However, at that moment, I thought they were the only ones I could rely on. On my way home from the hospital, I called my mother. I'm sorry, I'm gonna get a divorce, and I want to come back for a while. Is that okay? Hearing the tone of my voice, my mother sensed something was wrong. Okay, I understand. I'll tell your father. 
Just pack what you can for tomorrow. We'll rent a large vehicle and come over. When I got home, I packed my belongings as my mother instructed. I couldn't take everything, so I left the furniture, I packed my clothes, accessories, and mementos in boxes. I came across a photo of me and my husband, I wasn't sure if I should keep it. I loved him, and I thought we could have lived happily together, if it weren't for this incident. But I knew there was no going back. I'm sure he'll contact a divorce lawyer by tomorrow, and I've decided to throw away all the pictures of my husband once and for all. The next day, my parents came over in a large truck that could carry all my stuff. Long time no see. You probably didn't sleep well last night. I'll drive so you can just rest in the car, my father said as he, as he drove the long six-hour journey by himself. My father had told me to get some sleep, but tears streamed down my face in the back seat, overwhelmed by my parents' kindness. I wasn't sure if they noticed or not, but they didn't say a word to me while sitting in the front. After about three hours, my parents and I made it back home safely. I know you're tired, but could you tell me a bit more about what happened? You haven't done anything wrong, right? Given the situation, there's a chance you could be arrested, so I really want you to tell me everything, my parents asked, looking for more details. I explained that I was suspected of stealing my mother-in-law's necklace, and now was being accused of pushing her down the stairs. That's a lie, right? Why would anyone make up such a story? My mother asked. I think someone either wanted to harass you, or they had something to hide. Those are the only two options I see. Something to hide? Maybe someone who shouldn't have been there was present, and Patricia got seriously injured by accident. So they're trying to blame it on Sarah? To cover it up, maybe? My father added. What he said made sense, but I had always thought such things only happened in TV shows or movies. No official complaint was made, and I just wanted to get a peaceful divorce. However, it seemed my parents thought otherwise. Well, it makes sense. If their only daughter was being framed, they would want to know the truth, I thought to myself. Being framed, they naturally wanted to prove her innocence. Maybe we should do a bit more investigation. I'll also reach out to some people I know. Considering my parents' advice, I decided to look deeper into the matter. Just as I was about to look into the situation in detail, divorce papers from my husband's attorney were mailed to my parents' house. I thought having the divorce papers in front of me might make me reconsider. But to my surprise, I realized my feelings for my ex-husband Mark were gone, probably because he had never supported me. Over time and through various events, I just didn't love Mark anymore. Having finally cut ties with Mark and both his parents, I began to seriously investigate the incident. Patricia, who used to be my mother-in-law, didn't seem to have filed a complaint, and it appears the police and hospital staff find it a bit suspicious. Given the fuss she made, everyone probably expected her to file a complaint. Digging deeper would be quite a hassle. So I decided to seek help from my father. He used to work for the NYPD, so he has many connections within the force. He was able to arrange for me to view the security footage from the nearby cameras. Security cameras don't store footage for very long, but thankfully, the footage around the staircase where Patricia was allegedly pushed was still available. Examining the footage closely, it was clear that Patricia was indeed pushed down the stairs. However, no matter how much they zoomed in, it wasn't me. To further solidify my alibi, I checked the footage from where I was at the same time. It showed me taking care of some business. This proved my innocence. Turns out when I got the call about Patricia's accident, I was at a different hospital. Having endured more than my fair share of harassment from Patricia and her group, I had been visiting a psychiatrist. That day, I had an appointment, and the footage showed me leaving the psychiatrist's office. This confirmed I wasn't to blame, but I wasn't going to let it end there. To clear my name from all the humiliation I had suffered, I chose to confront Patricia and her group head on. I brought an attorney with me and headed to Mark's house. After consulting with an attorney, it turned out that due to the emotional distress I had suffered, I might be able to claim compensation. At home, there were Mark, Patricia, and Bill, my ex-father-in-law, all staring at us with puzzled looks. Who's that guy? I asked, why bring someone like that here now? In response to Patricia, 
The attorney presented a document. What's this? I asked. The document stated that I was not the cause of Patricia's injury, and that someone else had pushed her down the stairs. I apologize. I apologize for the late introduction. I am Sarah's attorney. Um, as mentioned in this, this document, Sarah was somewhere else on the day you testified that she was pushed down the stairs? Of course, we have already verified the truth with security camera footage. If you would like, I can show you the footage. And there was another person visible near the stairs besides you, Patricia. When the attorney explained that much, Patricia quickly pulled the document towards herself. What the heck is this? Just when I thought you would suddenly show up. This? This is all in the past. I said I would forgive you, so please do not bring it up anymore. Patricia was clearly panicking. Both Mark and Bill seemed suspicious. Why are you so flustered? If Mom did not do anything wrong, you should be confident about it. That's right. We are on Patricia's side, after all. Despite their reassuring words, Patricia's face grew paler. Aren't you too curious about who pushed Patricia down the stairs? I do wonder. Who was it? Who would do such a thing to my dear wife? I will not forgive them. Well, hold on a second. Ignoring Patricia's attempt to stop me, I continued. It was Patricia's affair partner. Go a fair partner? Patricia had been infatuated with a man for some time. That man was a bartender, and Patricia had gone into debt just to lavish money on him. However, no matter how much money she gave him, he never truly belonged to her. Frustrated, Patricia confronted him. That confrontation took place at the top of those stairs. Even though Patricia did not own the man, reports indicate that there was a physical relationship between them. It seems Patricia was waiting for the man to leave the bartender job, but he showed no signs of leaving and often went out with other customers. The man had always seen Patricia as a troublesome client, and in a fit of anger, he allegedly pushed her down the stairs. Realizing the gravity of his actions, the man tried to help Patricia, but she said, It's okay. We'll say my daughter-in-law did this. You should go home. Unable to approach the police for this particular investigation, they had no choice but to hire a private investigator. Pictures capturing the two are clear, and there's no way to deny it. Upon presenting the evidence to the police, an immediate investigation was launched, and the man was arrested. During interrogation, he confessed everything that transpired between him and Patricia on the staircase. Tell me to lie. Please say it isn't true. Cheating, huh? You're the worst. Realizing there's no escaping the truth, Patricia immediately began to apologize. I'm sorry. I was just so lonely. What do you mean, lonely? Lonely? I've always been there for you. We're getting a divorce? I don't want to hear any excuses. Upon being exposed, Patricia faced an immediate decision of divorce. Though she tried desperately to salvage her relationship with Bill, he was too enraged to listen. Mark too was shocked to learn of his mother's infidelity and looked at Patricia with disgust. Moreover, the amount of debt Patricia accumulated to lavish her lover was several hundred thousand dollars, an amount she couldn't possibly repay with her pension alone. Patricia wasn't the type to save money, so repaying the debt would likely take a significant amount of time. She begged Mark for help, but he snapped back. Are you kidding me? Because of your lies, I divorced Sarah? I'm not giving you a single dime for the money you borrowed for your lover. In the end, Patricia faced both a divorce and being disowned by Mark. Unable to repay the money and left without a place to stay, Patricia had no choice but to sadly return to her own home. To pay off the debt as soon as possible, it seems that Patricia's elder brother, who took over the family house, has taken on the responsibility. However, she'll be isolated until she repays all the money to him. Patricia can't just go outside as she pleases, and she doesn't have any money to spend freely. When Patricia receives her pension, it's all ordered to be given to her brother. I bet she regrets mingling with that bar and harassing me. I haven't seen Patricia since then, but apparently the once youthful looking Patricia has aged considerably. And for me, having been mentally tormented by those three on a daily basis, I managed to get a small amount in damages. From a certain point, whenever I spoke to those three, I always made sure to have a voice recorder on, so I had more than enough evidence when claiming for damages. Later on, I received numerous messages and voicemails from Mark expressing his wish to reconcile. 
but I'm not gonna get back with Mark. Even though he had promised to always be on my side when we moved in together, just thinking of being with Mark who couldn't even keep that single promise gives me the creeps. I'm sure if we were together in the future, I'll find more unpleasant things about him, and in the end, I'd be the one getting hurt. It seems Mark and Bill are living together, but with Patricia and I gone, their house is said to be filled with a cold atmosphere. Bill isn't very strong health-wise, so he needs regular hospital visits. Mark juggles his job and housework while also driving Bill to and from the hospital. It must be quite tough for him. I get diary-like messages from him every day about his daily struggles, but I usually send them straight to the trash without reading all of them. Since divorcing Mark, I've been enjoying my single life. I've successfully found a new partner and am happy with my decision. I found a new job and became a beauty advisor, something I've always wanted to be. Up until now I was always occupied with looking after Mark and my in-laws, so my own beauty regimen was always put on the back burner. During a time when I was away from my in-laws I visited a department store's cosmetic section. There I received advice on how to enhance my beauty and was told how to be more confident. That was the first time in my life I felt so confident and I believe the beauty advisor at that time played a huge role in shaping who I am today. That's why I decided to pursue a career as a beauty advisor, hoping to inspire others the way I was inspired. Although the job involves many behind-the-scenes tasks and challenges, I find it fulfilling. Thankfully, since becoming a beauty advisor, I've received many compliments on my appearance. I've even started to attract attention from men. A while back, a man approached me at a cafe, and we've been on several dates since. Just the other day, after confessing his feelings, we officially started dating. He knows I'm divorced, and even after knowing my past, he expressed his feelings for me. Unlike Mark, he's always supportive, and he's the first one to lend a hand when I'm in need. It's been three years since my divorce from Mark, and I'll soon turn 40. Lately, I've been considering if remarrying wouldn't be such a bad idea. But first and foremost, I want to be someone I'm proud of and continue to improve myself. I genuinely wish that women with similar feelings would be more confident and speak up without fear. This is today's dinner. Pizza and hamburgers are good, right? The? What's this? Frozen food again? We've been having frozen meals a lot lately. Don't you think it's disrespectful to a man who's been working all day? I'm sorry. I'm just nearing my due date. And it's really tough. Enough already. You really don't lift a finger, do you? It must be nice living like that. True. Lately, because of my late pregnancy, we've had a lot of frozen, frozen meals. But why do I have to struggle and push through alone when my husband doesn't help at all? Not just with meals, but with chores, too. He's still mad. I thought to myself, trying to smoothly change the topic. Hey, I forgot to get the mail from the mailbox. Can you grab it for me? I didn't want to upset him more with the frozen food issue, so I reluctantly got up and headed for the front door. And then, in the next moment, I heard the distinct click of the front door locking behind me. Hey, what's the big idea? You take people for granted too much. If you love frozen meals so much, why don't you freeze outside? I didn't have my phone with me. How could I spend all night outside in below freezing temperatures? As I started to panic, a man approached from behind. When I explained my situation to him, he approached from behind. I'm a 31-year-old stay-at-home wife. My husband and I got married three years ago, and we're still just the two of us living together. My husband, who works at a small business, and I, a stay-at-home wife, weren't exactly rolling in dough. However, we were content with our current lifestyle. Above all, we were overjoyed when we had a baby last month. Every day was a blessing. I'm home. I picked up some deli food from the supermarket today. Thanks. I'm sorry for being such a handful with my morning sickness. It's okay. I'm gonna hop in the shower now. Being pregnant was a first-time experience for me, and everything felt new. I had heard from friends who had been pregnant about the struggles of morning sickness, but mine was much worse than usual. Not only were household chores difficult, but even getting up to go to the bathroom was a struggle when I was lying on the couch. However, my husband was understanding and supported me like a true gentleman. 
This made me believe that I could get through this tough phase. Many of my friends had husbands who weren't as understanding during pregnancy. Knowing I didn't have that problem was a relief. However, we have my parents' 30th wedding anniversary tomorrow, so we're going to my family's place. I'm sorry, can I maybe skip it? It's just that the three-hour drive one way might be too much for me right now. I've always been there for you. The least you can do is listen to me once in a while. It's pretty thoughtless of you to consider missing my parents' big day. It's true that I've always been grateful for his parents. I would love to attend if I could. When we announced our pregnancy, they came to celebrate and even helped with some wedding costs. They've always been kind to us. But even considering how much I appreciate them, my morning sickness was just too intense to think about attending their 60th celebration. I believe my husband understands that I'm suffering from morning sickness, but he can't truly feel what it's like. So it seems like he really wants me to attend no matter what. We can visit them another day. Would that be okay? I think your mother-in-law would understand. We're always indebted to my parents. It's plain rude not to go. Plus, I already told them you're fine and going to come, so don't look too sick in front of them. I get where he's coming from, but he could be a little more considerate about my situation. Stress is the worst enemy during pregnancy, and his parents' place is a three-hour drive away from here. We'd leave early in the morning and probably return late at night. But if he's already told them we're coming, it's hard for me to back out now. It was hard for me to back out and I didn't want to argue further and worsen his mood, so I reluctantly agreed. Thankfully, I had medication to lessen my morning sickness and I decided to take it before we left the next day. As expected, I felt terrible in the morning but thanks to the medication I felt a bit better. I thought maybe I could get through just this one day. So we headed to his parents' place. Their house was out in the countryside and as we got closer the roads got worse. The bumpy ride made me feel even sicker, and just the thought of taking the same route back home weighed on my mind. But I tried to compose myself before we arrived. The roads were busy being the weekend, and it took about three and a half hours. But when we finally arrived at his parents' place, I took a few deep breaths to compose myself before entering. It's been a while. Thank you so much for coming, I told James. I said it would be okay if he came by himself knowing you weren't feeling well. Are you really okay? I'm fine. Thank you for your concern. I figured. My mother-in-law, having given birth to James and his brother, understood morning sickness more than I did. She knew the struggles and was concerned about me, right from the get-go. If my mother-in-law was saying all that, I felt like I probably didn't need to come in the first place. But since I was already there, complaining to my husband now wouldn't help. Besides, the main focus was on the two people celebrating their 60th birthday, and I tried my best not to draw unnecessary attention. But it was pretty exhausting, both physically and mentally, to be on my guard all day. By the time we left, I think my fatigue was evident. I didn't want to inconvenience my driving husband, so I didn't sleep in the passenger seat, even though I wanted to. Why did you look so bored? Huh, I didn't mean to. I'm sorry. My parents are there. You know you have to be more considerate, right? Yeah, I'm sorry. I do think I looked tired before we left his parents' place. My mother-in-law even said, Sorry for keeping you up so late, especially being pregnant when we were leaving. I understand that my husband might be upset about that, but... I wish he'd be more considerate of how I'm feeling first. It's not like I complained, and even with the morning sickness, I tried my best all day to not let it show. Usually, if I can't handle the housework, I'd rest. Wouldn't a simple, were you okay in the car? Been nice? It's like I didn't endure or sacrifice anything. Why can't he understand my feelings more? Such feelings welled up inside me, but I thought anything I'd say to my husband now would just add fuel to the fire. Whether it's morning sickness or whatever, he only seemed to focus on the fact that I looked tired in front of his parents and seemed oblivious to anything else. Then came a sermon from him, and after it seemed he was satisfied, he went silent. The two-hour ride home was filled with an indescribable tension. By the time we got home, it was past 10 p.m., and I was completely drained. 
Of course, having driven such a long distance, he must have been even more tired than I was. But, I was at my limit and immediately laid down on the couch. Just when I felt relieved, a wave of sleepiness hit me. I thought if I fall asleep now, that won't be good. I need to at least change my clothes and get to the bedroom. As I was grappling with these thoughts, I realized there was no beer in the fridge. I asked my husband if he had forgotten to put some in after drinking last night. I reminded him that he should at least manage that much. He responded by saying he was going to take a bath and asked me to go buy some beer. I was exhausted from morning sickness all day and it was already past 10 p.m. I couldn't believe he was asking me to go out and buy beer at this hour. It seemed devilish to me. I had been feeling like he didn't care about me as much as he did when we first got married, but I never imagined it would be to this extent. He was grumpy in the car too. I knew he would get mad if I refused, but I was at my limit. I couldn't walk to the convenience store to buy beer. It just wasn't possible. I was exhausted and had a rough day with morning sickness. I had told him this many times, but he didn't seem to care. To him, it was just irrelevant talk. He went straight to the bathroom without listening to anything I had to say, giving me a cold, accusing look. It was clear he was serious. After he finished his bath, I let out a frustrated sigh and hit the couch with my fist. I knew I had to go now, or I didn't know what would happen next. This was my last chore for the night. I quickly went to the convenience store, bought three beers, and rushed home. Luckily, my husband, who usually takes long baths, hadn't come out yet. I put the beers in the fridge and headed straight for the bedroom. I changed and immediately fell asleep, completely exhausted. I was impressed with how far I had pushed myself. I wanted to give myself a pat on the back. The next morning, I realized my husband must have slept in because he didn't come to bed after his nightly drinks. He didn't wake up until midday the next day. Morning sickness was still bad, but it was somewhat better than the day before. Thinking I should get things done while I can, I managed to finish most of the house chores by mid-morning. As my belly grew larger, every task felt heavier, and the supportive husband I knew at the beginning of my pregnancy was nowhere to be seen. He used to be there for me, but now he just complains. I don't know what changed his attitude, but I've been doing my best every day so he won't complain, and both mentally and physically, I've been exhausted. Fast forward and I'm now in my final month of pregnancy. Raising the child will surely be a challenge once they're born, but at least this tough pregnancy journey is coming to an end. Thinking that I'll finally meet our beloved baby soon, a sense of excitement was slowly building in my heart, different from the tough days I've been through. Welcome home. You're late, aren't you? Got some work stuff. What's for dinner tonight? Was thinking of having the pizza and burgers I got from Costco the other day. Seriously? Frozen food again. Are you making fun of me? I'm pregnant, and doing housework is all I can handle, right now. If my husband helped with the regular chores, I could adjust my energy and time for cooking. But right now, it's impossible for me to do everything. He gets super angry if I don't do the chores even though I have to cut down on cooking time. I wish he'd help out a bit if he's going to complain. My husband, who's about to become a father soon, doesn't act like one at all. I wonder if this is really going to work out. I decided to speak my mind because I've been holding back a lot. Look, it's impossible for me to do everything by myself. It would be nice if you helped. When you have time, you're always out drinking or playing golf. You're hardly ever home. I'm about to give birth, so expecting me to be perfect is just unreasonable. Are you trying to go against me? I'm just stating the facts. I thought he would definitely get mad at me for saying all that, but I was at my breaking point. I spoke my mind without holding back my emotions. After I finished speaking, calmed down, bracing myself for the lecture I was sure my husband would give me, but shockingly, he just started fiddling with his phone without saying a word. Weird. Why isn't he yelling at me today? Earlier, I couldn't hold back and said something pretty harsh. Normally, my husband would have snapped back at me tenfold. Maybe the mention of being almost due made him realize his responsibility as a soon-to-be father for the first time. Well, anyway, I'm just glad nothing happened, and that night we had frozen food for dinner. Because he came home late, we didn't finish dinner. 
We didn't finish dinner until around midnight. After taking a bath, it was past 1 a.m. when I was ready for bed. Hey, before you go to bed, can you check the mailbox? No? At this hour? What's the big deal? It's just a small thing. Was he still upset about me serving frozen food for dinner, I wonder? Well, he hasn't been nagging me as he usually does, so I don't want to push it, and checking the mailbox will only take a minute. Doing as he asked, I went to the gate to check the mailbox. I did just as my husband told me, heading to the front gate to check the contents of the mailbox. But there was nothing inside. I wonder what he wanted me to see. It was deep winter and temperatures were well below freezing at night. Dressed in thin pajamas, I nearly froze as I hurried back towards the house. But, just as I reached for the doorknob, suddenly there was a click from the inside, and the door was locked. What on earth? What's going on? Come on, let me in. It's below freezing, probably about as cold as inside a freezer, right? You seem to really love those frozen meals, so why not stay out here and freeze with them? What? No, wait. Hey! It seemed like my husband had either gone to bed or was ignoring me. It was 2 a.m. and it would be impossible to stay out in this freezing cold until dawn. Besides, I was only planning to check the mailbox and head right back, so I was really underdressed. I felt like I might freeze to death. My face and hands were burning from the cold, and my body was shivering uncontrollably. I didn't know what to do. My thoughts were becoming foggy. I repeatedly pressed the doorbell, hoping my husband would come to my aid, but there was no response from him. Was this his way of getting back at me for using frozen food? I hoped he would let me in after a few minutes, so I kept calling out to him from outside. But time just went by and there was no sign of my husband. I was getting so cold that I was running out of energy. How much longer would I have to wait? Just as I was thinking this, I heard footsteps approaching from behind. What happened to you? I asked. I was taken aback by this unfamiliar man, but he appeared to be a bartender who worked at a nearby bar. Since he usually slept during the day, I had never run into him before. It seemed he had closed up shop early that day and was returning home around 2 a.m. when he ran into me. What's going on? I asked. At the very least, let me get you something to wear. Though he was a stranger in the neighborhood, his gesture of offering his coat without inviting me into his home felt genuinely gentlemanly. It made me trust him, at least a little. He continued to listen to my story outside my house. Of course, normally I'd never share personal family matters with a stranger, but I was so emotionally overwhelmed at the moment, it wasn't the time to be concerned about that. I borrowed his cell phone and reached out to some folks I knew. I promised to repay him later and decided to spend the night at a business hotel. Once I reached the warm hotel room, a sense of relief washed over me, and I quickly drifted off to sleep. Before I knew it, morning had come. After checking out, I headed home. To my surprise, waiting at the gate were my in-laws. I expressed my gratitude for them coming so quickly after my call last night. But the moment I stepped onto the property, I was left speechless. What? What on earth are you doing? There was my husband freezing without any clothes on. Even in the morning, the temperature hadn't risen above 41 degrees Fahrenheit. Why wasn't he wearing anything? It made no sense. But what was even stranger was the glaring look my in-laws were giving him. Could it be? Did they do this? As these thoughts ran through my mind and I tried to grasp the situation, I realized that my in-laws had orchestrated the whole situation. When the bartender helped me out, I immediately borrowed his phone to call my mother-in-law. I was so lucky that my mother-in-law picked up quickly and that I remembered her number. I honestly told her everything that had happened with my husband and the recent incident. And there was another thing. I shared a shocking suspicion with my mother-in-law that I had heard from the bartender. Thank you for all you've done. It's the least we can do. And, as you mentioned, the rumors of his affair turned out to be true. We had a spare key to our house, so we came in early this morning and confronted our foolish son. We checked his phone, and there was clear evidence of his affair. I felt a pang of pity for my husband abandoned outside in the cold without any clothes, but the moment I confirmed his infidelity, any sympathy I had for him vanished. I had never considered the possibility of his cheating before. 
The suspicion arose just yesterday. The bartender told me he had seen my husband downtown with a younger woman. Because of his line of work in an area with lots of nightclubs and bars, he had seen my husband with a young lady a few weeks ago. Before we were married, we used to have barbecues in our backyard quite often, so I believe he recognized us. When I first heard about it, I didn't have any solid proof and I wanted to trust him. I wanted to trust my husband, but if he had found someone new and stopped caring about me and stopped supporting me, especially while I'm pregnant, everything would make sense. I had shared all of this with my in-laws over the phone, but to find out it was true, it was just disappointing. If you're freezing, why don't you ask your beloved girlfriend to warm you up with her body warmth? No, um, James looked as pale as a ghost whose lips turning a shade of purple. Considering the in-laws have been here for over three hours, he must have been left out in the cold for at least that long. It makes me wonder just how much he's suffered. Well, he tried to do the same to me, so he's in no position to complain. He probably can't hold a proper conversation because the cold has numbed his mind. But honestly, I couldn't care less. I think you know this, but I won't accept this. I'm gonna file for divorce. What? He already looked pretty miserable from the cold, but at the mention of divorce, his face went even paler. I figured, if he was treating me like this, and having a good time with his mistress, she must be more important to him. Then again, maybe he's just scared of the potential alimony and child support. Either way, I doubt he ever loved me, and I don't have a shred of love left for him either. I'm going to sue your lover for emotional damage too, so you better be ready. Hold on, let's talk. There's nothing to talk about. I'll decide on the alimony and child support. You don't have a choice in this. Know your place. Father-in-law chimed in with a firm tone, leaving husband speechless. Of course, he probably wants to get inside the house quickly to escape the freezing cold, but I think he's even more devastated about what's to come. But he's only ever acted selfishly, so this is all a result of his own actions. He's probably gonna regret this for the rest of his life, and I hope he does. With those thoughts in mind, I decided to move back to my parents' place and leave my husband for my in-laws to handle. I could tell just by looking at him that he was so frail he might need to go to the hospital. But he tried to do the same thing to me, so I have absolutely no reason to be concerned. After returning to my parents' home, I confessed everything to them. They told me it was okay to stay and raise my child there, for which I couldn't be more grateful. I decided I wanted to focus on giving birth first, so I asked my in-laws to wait until after the birth before confronting my husband. Being close to my due date, about two weeks after returning home, I gave birth to a big baby boy, weighing nearly eight pounds. The moment he was born, he cried out loud, and I was so moved that I shed tears, feeling the reality of becoming a mother. For the next three months, I devoted myself to parenting at my parents' place. As I began to get used to life with a baby, I asked my mother-in-law and father-in-law to come visit us near my parents' home. Wow, what a healthy little boy. Congratulations on the birth. I'd always been treated well by my in-laws, and under the condition that husband wouldn't accompany them, I let them hold my son. The two of them, holding my son with smiles on their faces, looked like children themselves. I felt a pang of anger towards my husband, thinking about how this should have been a happier celebration. But getting mad now seemed pointless. After spending some quality time with my son, my in-laws shifted the conversation back to my ex-husband and helped finalize discussions about alimony and child support. Thanks to their efforts over the past three months, the whole truth about my husband's affair came to light. We consulted a lawyer they knew, and it was decided he would pay me the standard amount. Of course, I couldn't trust a husband who cheated, so he made a lump sum payment. He took out a loan to cover the alimony, but when it came to 20 years of child support, that was too much for him to handle, even with a loan. My in-laws graciously stepped in to help. With the divorce finalized, he is now just a stranger to me. My ex-husband is going to pay my in-laws monthly for the child support they covered. From what I heard, it turned out that my ex-husband hadn't even told his mistress he was married. She dumped him when she found out, leaving him all alone. 
He is now living with his parents and giving them 90% of his earnings to repay the debt. The remaining 10% barely covers his food, leaving him with no spending money. I am not sure how long he will continue this way, but with no savings and only the passing of time once he has paid off his debt to his parents, it seems they might kick him out. Even when he is free from this financial hell, it seems he has nothing but despair ahead of him. Well, he brought this upon himself, so I guess he is getting what he deserves. As for me, I am living at my parents' house, doing my best to raise my child as a single mom. I am still figuring out the ropes of parenthood, but my mom has been a great help, especially during those sleepless nights. It has made the whole experience mentally easier and enjoyable. I plan on relying on my parents for a while, and once my son starts elementary school, I think I will get back to work. Plus, I still keep in touch with my in-laws, and plan to visit them with my son a few times a year. While my ex-husband has ruined my life, I have a precious new beginning with my baby, and I am determined to lead a happy life from here on out. Thank you for taking care of the stupid old. My brother-in-law and his wife had promised to move with my mother-in-law who has dementia. However, they dumped her belongings and swiftly left. Left, forcing us to take care of her. My husband and I were in shock, but my mother-in-law was nodding with a smile. However, today's smile from her wasn't her usual confused one. My mother-in-law waved at their car with a grin, and then she loudly said, they don't have a home anymore. Huh? No more home? What in the world is she talking about? What was this surprising counterattack from my mother-in-law on my brother-in-law and his wife who were looking forward to moving? My name is Christine Parker. I'm 34 and work at a company. My husband David and I shared the same hobbies and we both tragically lost our parents early in life. David lost his father during his college years, while I lost both my parents in a car accident when I was young. We both had longings for a warm family, so we got married pretty quickly. At the time of our wedding, my mother-in-law told me, from now on, think of me as your real mother. You can always rely on me. It was comforting for someone like me, who had lost her parents at a young age, to hear such words. After our marriage, we frequently visited her. Those were happy days, but I had one concern. It was David's elder brother, Michael. Michael, two years older than David, was 36 at the time we got married, and was still single, living at home. I had no problem with him living at home, but Michael was the complete opposite of David in terms of personality. While David is reserved and humble, Michael judges people by their appearance and status. If he deems someone beneath him, he's outright rude, a typical jerk. Moreover, Michael looks down on David and me, working at an average company, and ridicules us every time he sees us. What? You're here again? Must be nice to have so much free time. I, working in a trading company, can't afford to be so leisurely. Even though we were visiting to see my mother-in-law, Michael would often say such things. I'm really sorry about the rude things, Michael says. I know I spoiled him, but lately he doesn't listen to me at all. My mother-in-law always apologized in his absence. I know I might be a pain sometimes, but I genuinely enjoy talking to you, Christine. Do you think you'll visit again? She had said that to me. We didn't want to leave her alone with Michael, and more than anything, I genuinely enjoyed our chats with her. So, David and I continued to visit her often. Then, about a year later, we suddenly heard that Michael was getting married. We knew Michael had found a girlfriend and had moved out, but was he getting married? It was quite a surprise for us. But after meeting his bride-to-be, it all made sense. Emily, the person Michael was marrying, was a unique and strong-willed individual. Quips, she identifies her occupation as a live streamer. Girls as cute as me will always be in demand no matter the age. Emily boldly stated this upon our first meeting, even though she is turning 35 this year. I am not one to comment on someone's profession, but I was taken aback that she could confidently refer to herself as a cute girl at 35. While the rest of us were taken aback by Emily's boastful introduction, Michael was sitting next to her, nodding proudly. We actually talked about wanting to become YouTubers as a couple, you know. But my company has a strict no-side-job policy. They are so behind the times, aren't they? 
I genuinely felt relieved that my brother-in-law's company had that policy, but I wondered if it was okay for Michael to be nearing 40 and still talking like that. As we listened with a mix of astonishment, Emily suddenly turned the conversation to me. By the way, Christine, what do you do for work? I wish she would just leave me alone. Though I felt that way, I couldn't ignore her so I briefly introduced myself. But as soon as Emily heard my story, she quickly responded, Really? Doesn't that sound kind of bland? Are you actually enjoying your life doing that? Seriously, you guys seem to have such dull lives. It's a once-in-a-lifetime chance, you know? Gotta live it up, or you're missing out. To top it all off, even Michael joined in with those remarks. With a concerned look on her face, my mother-in-law said, well, if you two have decided on this, I won't oppose your marriage. Just make sure you don't inconvenience others and work together to live an honest life. After my mother-in-law made her point clear, the two of them left in a hurry. I really wondered if those two would be alright in the future. Watching them leave, we exchanged worried glances. Michael was a handful on his own, and now there was another problematic person to deal with. Still, for my mother-in-law and David, Michael is a cherished family member, just the same. We immediately began discussing how we should interact with the two of them moving forward. Despite our concerns, everything was peaceful for about a year. Are you sure you're okay on your own? Wanna come live with us? We had offered my mother-in-law to stay with us. However, she reassured us, I'm fine on my own. Don't worry about me. I have plenty of friends around here. Just focus on living a happy life together. Indeed, my mother-in-law is sociable and has many friends in the neighborhood. But she is already 63 years old. While folks in their 60s these days are still quite spry, we can't help but worry about the what-ifs. With these thoughts in mind, we visited her that day. Then to our surprise, Michael and Emily had come over. In the year since they have been together, they have grown and matured. In the year since they got married, they hadn't visited the house at all. Yet now, they were lounging around, as if they owned the place. Oh, David, you guys are here too? What's the occasion? We come over every week, David replied. Michael gave him a look, as if he wanted to say something, but then turned to my mother-in-law and said, All right then, take care. With that, they promptly left. What were they here for? David asked my mother-in-law. She replied, It's nothing, really. She didn't seem inclined to talk about it at all. Michael's last words had piqued my curiosity, so I chimed in. You say it's nothing, but there must be a reason. What was that? However, my mother-in-law just gave vague answers. Please, if there's anything going on, let us know anytime. In the end, we told her that and headed home for the day. That evening, David received a call from Michael. David, it seems like you guys visit Mom quite often. Could you stop? He blurted out unexpectedly. When pressed for an explanation, he said, You guys must be busy with work, right? Emily is working from home and will take care of Mom, so just stop coming over. Then he abruptly hung up the phone. They had been married for a year, and after not seeing her for so long, this sudden demand seemed suspicious. What on earth is Michael thinking? Driven by our concerns, we visited her the following weekend. And sure enough, Michael and Emily were there too. The moment Michael saw us, he looked irritated and said, What do you want? I told you we're going to take care of Mom. There's no need for you to come. We tried to defend ourselves, but my mother-in-law's subsequent words left us speechless. David, Christine, thank you for always coming over despite being busy. But as Michael said, from now on, he will be visiting. So you two enjoy your weekends. To our shock, my mother-in-law was siding with Michael. Hearing this, a smug-looking Michael said, You heard what Mom said, right? If you get it, then get going. With that said, we were kicked out of the house? We couldn't believe it, but if my mother-in-law says so, there's nothing we can do. Still concerned for her, we started calling her more often. Everything okay? You're doing well? Every time she'd reply, Michael is visiting, so I'm fine. But how about you two? Are you having a good time? She seemed more concerned about us than herself. We're having fun, but we'd like to see you from time to time. Can we come over this weekend? I've already made plans with Michael this weekend. I'm sorry, maybe next time. In the end, we were left feeling confused and hurt by the sudden change in dynamics. In the end, she always declined our visits. 
We didn't mind what Michael said, but when my mother-in-law pushed us away it felt like a rejection making us feel a bit lonely. Then one day, after days like that, David received another call from Michael. We're going to move, so there's no point in you coming here anymore, Michael said. David was at a loss for words with the sudden news. Michael was about to hang up the phone. In a panic, I quickly asked, why are you suddenly moving? Michael, with a sharp click of his tongue, replied, you guys haven't been to the house recently, so you probably don't know. Mom's going senile. We're worried about leaving her alone, so we're building a new house and moving. My mother-in-law is becoming senile? That can't be, I exclaimed. Uh, she was fine the last time we spoke on the phone. But Michael snapped, you only talked to her briefly, right? How could you tell from that? She's got dementia. That's what's going on. And with that, he hung up. We hurriedly called my mother-in-law and asked, Are you feeling all right? Is everything okay? But she simply replied, I'm fine, I'm fine. You don't need to worry about a thing. And then she hung up. What on earth is happening? I thought, that weekend, we hurriedly headed to her place. Naturally, Michael and Emily were there. You're back again? I told you not to come anymore. Michael approached us with a sharp click of his tongue. How can we just sit still after hearing such news? We're worried, I replied. But Michael snapped, shut up. However, my mother-in-law just listened to our argument with a smile and a nod. I couldn't help but look at her and whispered her name. Michael, having heard that, said, I told you. She doesn't make sense anymore. We can't leave her alone, so we're taking her in. That's our kindness. You get it? He said it with a smirk. If that's the case, we can... But before I could finish, Michael interrupted. Both of you work, right? What are you going to do with this senile old woman during the day? Don't talk about her that way, I blurted out. But in fact, no one is home during the day in our house. I couldn't argue that point and just remained silent. It's frustrating, but maybe we have to do as Michael says for now, we said. We'll come visit on our days off. Upon saying that, Emily then replied, If you come over that often, it'll be such a bother for me. I really don't like it. With her usual lisping way of speaking, the thought of leaving my mother-in-law with someone like her made me worried. I exchanged a worried glance with David, but he just looked down and shook his head. His head. Whether my mother-in-law understood or not, she just kept smiling and said, hey, it's okay. Later, we received the moving schedule from Michael and reluctantly headed home. On moving day, when we arrived at my in-law's house, we were informed that the packing had just been completed. Emily remarked, If you were going to come, you should have come earlier and helped. Bad timing on your part. But when we looked inside, we saw that there were still many items left. There's still a lot of stuff here. I pointed out, Michael replied, We don't want to take this old junk with us. We're gonna toss it. A few pieces of clothing are more than enough for an old lady. Both Emily and Michael were saying such things together. Hey, stop it! I yelled in frustration. Michael shot back. Then you guys take care of her. And they both jumped in their car. As they drove off, they threw a bag containing a few of my mother-in-law's clothes out the window, shouting, Good luck with the old lady. Bye. They left us with those parting words, then coolly drove off to their new place. David and I stood there, dumbfounded. Yet my mother-in-law just kept smiling and nodding. But today, she wasn't wearing her usual absent-minded smile. Instead, she had that sharp and slightly mischievous grin I knew so well from back in the day. As I looked at her, puzzled, my mother-in-law waved cheerfully at their car. Then she said just one thing. They don't have a home anymore. What? What on earth is she talking about? I looked at David, who was just as bewildered, staring at my mother-in-law. But ignoring our dumbfounded faces, my mother-in-law briskly picked up her bags and said, David, Christine, how long are you going to just stand there? Come on, let's go inside and have some snacks. What do you mean? I asked. She just looked back at us with a smile full of glee and beckoned us to the entrance. Once inside, she explained everything to us. What we learned was utterly astonishing. The reason why they recently came to visit her house and her scheme upon discovering it. Each piece of information was beyond our wildest imaginations. A few months back, they suddenly showed up at her place. There was an instance when my mother-in-law stepped out for a bit, 
and she overheard the two of them having an argument. Are you sure this is really okay? Hey, keep your voice down. Feeling a sense of foreboding, my mother-in-law discreetly listened in as Michael said, That old hag must have stashed some cash somewhere. If we play our cards right and end up living with her, we can take over her assets. But I really don't want to live with your mom. For the money, we have to bear with it. If only she'd go senile, we could hand her off to David. That would be perfect. We get the cash and let David take care of her. I wonder how we can make her senile. Is there a way to hasten it? It seems that for the first year of their marriage, they had a great time living together in their rented apartment. However, after a year of reckless spending, they blew through their savings, and Michael's salary wasn't enough to support them anymore. Emily claimed to be a live streamer, but she hardly had any fans, and was only broadcasting to a handful of viewers out of self-satisfaction. Naturally, that meant no real income was coming in. With their day-to-day -day life becoming more challenging, the two even resorted to borrowing from loan sharks. Desperate? They plotted to get their hands on my mother-in-law's assets. My mother-in-law was widowed young, but as it turns out, my father-in-law had been in real estate. Taking over, my mother-in-law turned out to be quite wealthy from the real estate business. Upon overhearing this conversation, she thought if she passed on the assets as they were, it would ruin the two of them. If they wished for it, then I shall oblige and play the part of the forgetful one. With that thought in her mind, she decided to feign dementia to scare the two of them off. Unaware that she was just pretending to have dementia, the couple brazenly started discussing their plans to take over the assets right in front of her. No way mom's really lost it, huh? Emily asked, did you do something? Of course not, she replied. Maybe my wish has worked. But what are we gonna do now? If she's gone senile this early, will we actually get the money? Don't worry, Michael reassured her. First, we tell her we want to build a house to live together. That way, she'll build the house and put it in my name. And then we say we need extra cash and get another $100,000. I bet if we play up the dementia angle, David and the others will say we should take care of it. Once we have her blessing, we can pass her off and live it up in our new place. How about that? My plan's bulletproof, right? Yeah, Emily agreed. Sounds awesome, but do you really think it'll go that smoothly? Don't worry about it, Michael replied. She's out of it, and plus, David and the others are so annoyingly righteous, it'll be fine. It's scary to think they were planning all along to dump her on us after securing the new house and the money, Emily said. But my mother-in-law even hearing this didn't panic and continued her preparations calmly, pretending to be confused. We were like, if you had just told us, Emily said. But she said I didn't want to involve you guys. Sorry for the worry, Michael added. However, hearing this, a question popped up for them. Wait a sec, but what about the house? David asked. My mother-in-law chuckled and replied, you'll see. You'll see soon enough. It's about time, isn't it? Right at that moment, the phone rang. It was Michael. When my mother-in-law answered, he shouted, What the heck is this? Michael was yelling. They were telling me, I can't live here because it's a rental contract. That's awful. You tricked us. Emily joined in making a scene. It turns out there was more to my mother-in-law's plan. She had conspired with a realtor, an old friend of her late husband, to prepare the new house they had bought to be rented out instead and today she was waiting on site for them. Moreover, she had inflated the cost and taken extra money from them to build a large parking lot, leaving them without any money to their name. With a smile, she informed them of this. Hey, I'm the owner of this house, aren't I? What gives you the right to do this? Oh, the owner? I seem to recall paying and putting it in my own name. You are supposed to be senile. Senile? What are you talking about? As you can see, I'm as sharp as ever. Damn you, old hag. I won't forget this. You'll never be forgiven. Michael was still yelling over the phone even now. But my mother-in-law unfazed and calm replied, Michael, knock it off. You're an adult now, it's time to stand on your own two feet. Relying on others and taking them for granted, making a fool of everyone around you. That's no way to go through life. After saying that, she nonchalantly hung up the phone. 
Additionally, she had already arranged for the movers to deliver the belongings not to the new house, but to a rental storage unit. Her friend was waiting at the storage facility, and she received confirmation that the belongings were safely delivered. I thought Michael's plan was diabolical, but it turned out my mother-in-law was even craftier. After that, Michael and Emily stormed into my mother-in-law's house, still fighting furiously. But since they were making such a scene when they arrived, we ended up calling the cops. And when the police showed up, Michael got violent with them too, and got himself arrested for obstructing an officer in the performance of their duties. Emily, who was watching, exclaimed, I didn't do anything and then she just took off running. Even though Michael was arrested, he was released soon after, since it was his first offense. With nowhere else to go, he was allowed to stay at the company dorm out of the company's goodwill, but the whole mess had become known at work, and he's feeling pretty small about it. But if he quits his job, he'll have neither a place to live nor any income. So he's biting the bullet and desperately working. Emily asked for a divorce from Michael and went back to her parents' house, but she's been disowned because of the whole ordeal. I heard she's living and working at a nightclub now. As for me, after all that went down, I got transferred to a department at my company that allows remote work, so now I'm working from home. And so we set up our new home near my mother-in-law's place and smoothly started living together with her. We've become really good friends with the real estate agent who helped us with the move and the neighbors around my mother-in-law's house. And now we even go out together as families. If only we had done this from the start. We chat about this, living peacefully day by day. Isn't today the anniversary of you and dad's marriage? I've got a present for you. As she said this, the daughter presented a document. It was a divorce paper with the husband's section already filled out. Sarah really is such a considerate and kind child, right? To think she prepared such a wonderful gift for our anniversary. You could have made an effort to look more put together, even at your age. There are plenty of women in their 50s who look young and beautiful. I don't need an old lady like you anymore. Dad says so, and I've never once thought of you as my mother in my whole 25 years. If you don't want to get sued for verbal abuse, you better pack up and leave fast. Both wearing hideous grins, they hurled abuse at me. Are you really sure about this? Things could get pretty rough, you know? I said this with emphasis, looking them straight in the eye, silently conveying the gravity of their choice. I am Jennifer, 55 years old, working for a major brokerage firm. I lived in a single-family home in New York with my husband, who is years younger than me and our 25-year-old daughter. I met my husband, Mike, when I was 23. After graduating from high school, Mike, who was a part-timer, worked at a convenience store near where I worked. I shopped there every day, so we naturally became acquainted. One day I made a mistake at work and felt terribly down. Holding back tears, I somehow managed to get through my tasks and was about to leave the company to head home when I bumped into Mike by chance. Seeing my face, he seemed surprised at first but quickly approached me with a friendly smile. Hey, are you heading home? I just got off my shift too. How about grabbing a bite to eat? I know someone who works at a diner nearby. Taken aback by his sudden invitation, I froze. Then Mike, looking somewhat lonely, said, Oh, did I bother you? I'm sorry. No, it's not that. I was just surprised, not bothered at all. Relieved by my response, Mike smiled and took my hand, leading me toward the diner. I went along with him for a meal, somewhat passively. But that day marked the beginning of our relationship of a close relationship and after several dates he asked me out when my parents passed away unexpectedly mike supported me devotedly our relationship continued smoothly and at 25 i married mike he had mentioned being estranged from his parents so we had a quiet wedding at a chapel abroad though he was a non-regular staff mike worked diligently and took over the household chores to help me who was busy with work when i was 30 i got pregnant with our daughter sarah and Mike became a full-time homemaker, which allowed me to return to work soon after giving birth. We supported and cooperated with each other, living happily. I never doubted that these peaceful days would continue forever. When Sarah started kindergarten, I decided to entrust Mike with some financial responsibilities, giving him a family credit card for necessary expenses. 
I kept a close eye on the card statements and Mike never made frivolous purchases, managing our home life well. I fondly recall seeing entries for indoor play areas for kids and children's clothing brands when Sarah was a baby. However, as she began elementary school, the situation started to look ominous. Around that time my workload increased, and I began neglecting to check the card statements. This turned out to be a mistake. One day, casually checking the bank account, I couldn't believe the amounts being withdrawn. The recorded figures were more than triple what I had anticipated, and looking back over six months, the expenses had gradually increased since Sarah's school entry. Luxury clothing and watches, star-rated restaurant lunches and high-end hotel stays had all accumulated, resulting in a hefty sum. I believe being a full-time homemaker is a respectable job, and I understand that Mike might want to indulge occasionally. I hated the idea of arguing over money, yet, when the amounts became this significant, I could no longer stay silent. That night, I brought up the topic of the household expenses with Mike. To my surprise, his calm demeanor instantly turned hostile, and he began to shout. So a full-time homemaker like me isn't allowed a little luxury now and then? Uh, you can focus on your job because I take care of everything at home. I've always appreciated what you do, Mike. That's why I don't mind occasional treats. But there has to be a limit. Do you have any idea how much you spent last month? When I asked him, my husband raised his voice in a fit of anger. Cut it out always dumping the household chores on me, and then you have the nerve to nag about everything? This was the first time my husband had ever talked back to me like this. I got caught up in the heat of the moment and confronted him. Think about it. The amount of money spent doesn't make sense. There's no need to buy unnecessary things. High-end clothes every month are unnecessary, and the cost for lunch is too much for one person. Who are you treating? I have my own social obligations, okay? Who I have lunch with, and where is none of your business, right? You're one to talk, going out drinking under the pretense of socializing. The reason I come home late from drinking is because of work-related socializing. It's not something I do because I want to. If I could, I would rather come home early to spend time with my family. Hearing my husband speak like that deeply saddened me. Social drinking after work is stressful and exhausting, I'd rather spend time with my family, and if I'm going to drink, I'd prefer to do it with you, Mike. I conveyed my feelings, but my husband just glared at me with a sullen look. After that, I didn't want to argue with him anymore, so I stopped nagging him about money. Still, I made sure to check the credit card statements regularly. His spending was getting worse. Not just fancy restaurant lunches, but it looked like he was also buying expensive jewelry for someone. I wanted to confront him immediately, but recalling our last exchange, I couldn't bring myself to do it. Then one day when I got home, our third grader Sarah came running up to me. Mom, my indoor shoes are too small. I need new ones. I've been asking Dad since last month, but he says you won't let me. She held out her worn shoes to me, the heels crushed down. I had asked my husband to replace school supplies and outgrown clothes before. However, it seems he neglected to do so and blamed it on me. I asked him again to please take care of our daughter's needs. From that day on, I noticed a change in the way Sarah looked at me. Apparently, my husband had made it seem as though nothing could be bought without my permission, casting me in the light of a controlling wife. By the time I realized it, it was too late. As Sarah grew up, she began to crave designer wallets and the latest smartphones. She would beg her father, and when he hesitated, she would come to me. When I advised her to adopt a more reasonable attitude towards money, she called me a stingy old hag and began to show open hostility. My husband sided with Sarah mocking me in their alliance. Whenever I spoke to him about the credit card bills, Sarah would come in and stop being mean to dad. If you made more money, we wouldn't have this problem. Why did dad ever marry a stingy old hag like you? You should be more grateful for what Dad does for us. Without him, you'd probably be alone living a sad, lonely life. By the time Sarah reached high school, she had become as willful and reckless with money as her father. Feeling like I also had to do something, I kept earnestly talking to my daughter, but no matter how hard I tried, she refused to listen. It was undone by my husband, who, being a stay-at-home dad, spent more time with her than I did. 
Yet, we somehow managed to get by because he did his part with the household chores properly. However, once my daughter started working part-time after graduating high school, my husband blatantly began to slack off on the housework. He seemed to be out often, and the house was empty when I returned from work. No cleaning or laundry had been done, and there was no meal prepared. Confronting my husband would surely just lead to a fight. My daughter was on his side, and there was no longer a place for me in this house. Then one day something definitive happened. It was our 30th wedding anniversary. When I came home from work, there stood my husband and daughter, grinning at me in the entryway. What's going on? I asked. Sarah looked at me with a spiteful smile and said, Isn't it our wedding anniversary today? I have a present for you. As she spoke, she handed me a document. It was a divorce paper with Mike's section already filled out. Sarah is such a considerate and kind girl, I thought to myself. To prepare such a wonderful gift for our anniversary, I couldn't help but feel a pang of sadness as I realized that my marriage was truly over. If only you had made an effort to dress up a bit, even at your age, Mike said, breaking the silence. There are plenty of women in their fifties who still look young and beautiful. We don't need an old lady like you anymore. And since Dad says so, you know I've never once thought of you as my mom in my 25 years. If you don't want to be sued for emotional abuse, you'd better get out fast, Sarah added. The two of them were throwing ugly sneers my way, spewing insults. Are you really sure about this? You're gonna regret it, I said, staring them down. Still, they kept grinning at me condescendingly. With a sigh, I took the divorce papers and said, All right. Let's get divorced. Mike's face relaxed with genuine happiness. Well then, since you're the breadwinner, we'll be taking the house. Sarah wants to live here with me, right? That's fine, isn't it? I replied calmly. Then Mike started talking about dividing assets. And about the division of property. You should give me half of your savings too. After all, you were able to focus on your work because of me, he said with pride. I responded in disbelief. Oh, you think I don't know anything? You've been having an affair with another woman using my card. Let's see, about $200,000 over 15 years. I could sue for the misused funds in alimony, you know. If you don't want this to get messy, you'd better back off quietly. It was a painful realization, but I knew that my marriage was truly over. Since Sarah was in elementary school, it seems she knew and approved of it. The documents from the detective agency included photos of Mike, his mistress, and Sarah, all enjoying a vacation together. Seeing the color drain from Mike's face was something else. And Sarah's eyes were darting all over. They never dreamed that I knew about the affair. Sarah, I'm disowning you as my child. Since you don't need a miserly old lady like me, it's fine, right? Ignoring their stunned faces, I packed my bags, took the divorce papers, and left the house. I spent the night at a hotel and submitted the divorce papers to the office the next day. Our divorce was finalized. Then I rented a reasonably priced apartment near my work and began living alone. But a year later Sarah started calling me non-stop. I had cut ties and was ignoring her, but eventually, exasperated by the persistent calls, I decided to answer. When I picked up the phone, Sarah was shrieking so loudly it was breaking up. What's this about demanding alimony now? You've ruined my life. When I divorced Mike, I deliberately didn't ask for alimony for a reason. Just before the divorce, I met with his mistress. When I told her I was Mike's wife, she turned pale and started apologizing. I'm sorry. I had no idea he was married. Lying won't help you now. It seems you've been quite involved with my daughter as well. As I casually pressed the play button on the tape recorder, a conversation of them cheerfully gossiping about me started to play. I'm so sorry, truly am. No need for apologies. With all this evidence, I'll be demanding a suitable amount for damages. I spoke with firm resolve and she hung her head, her face ashen. I knew she was struggling with money and that she had been seeing Mike, who was generous with his spending because of that. Then to her, who looked utterly drained, I suggested in a kind tone, you truly loved my husband, didn't you? And yet... Asking for a substantial amount in damages doesn't sit right with me. Her expression brightened up instantly. Yes, that's right. I really love Mike. That's what I thought. Then, in light of your feelings, I won't press for the damages. 
Please, take responsibility and care for my husband to the end. If you ever abandon him, I'll come after you for the damages, alright? I told her that if she didn't want to pay a hefty sum, she'd have to stick with Mike till the end. At that moment, she probably didn't take it too seriously. But not long after, our divorce was finalized. For her, Mike was just a convenient source of luxury, courtesy of my money. When the divorce was settled, Mike joyfully told her. She panicked and pleaded for a reduction in the damages, but I refused. You said you truly loved him, didn't you? If that was a lie, you must face the consequences. I won't be satisfied otherwise. When I conveyed this, she had no choice but to marry Mike. Sarah welcomed her as well, and maybe things were fine at the start. But it seems she couldn't stand it for long. Mike's lavish lifestyle was possible because of my earnings. After I was gone, they couldn't reduce their standard of living, splurging money like it was water. She worked tirelessly day and night trying to support their lifestyle, but Sarah seemed to scorn her, comparing her to me and hurling awful insults. Moreover, that house still had about five years left on the mortgage. That payment weighed heavily on them, and eventually, she couldn't take it anymore, and left a completed divorce form before disappearing. Learning she had run away, I sent a certified letter to my ex-husband, burdened not only with everyday expenses and the mortgage, but also the damages, Mike was at his wit's end. Hearing Sarah lash out in semi-hysteria, I couldn't help but snicker. It's because of what your dad did that we're in this situation with the damages. You're struggling now because you've lived beyond your means. If you're going to blame someone, don't blame me. Blame your father for not teaching you how to manage money properly. I told her calmly and then ignored the still ranting Sarah, hanging up the phone. And that very day I went to the store and changed my smartphone along with the number. After that I left everything to my lawyer who successfully secured the damages for me. According to the lawyer, Mike was initially very resistant. She and I met after I divorced that woman. It's outrageous to call it an affair. Plus, I've been the victim of her emotional abuse for years. She's a horrible woman. He complained to the lawyer. But I had been recording all the verbal abuse and had submitted evidence collected from the private detective as well as the credit card statements, which made it clear who was at fault. When the lawyer informed them that we had ample evidence, they seemed to realize that dragging out the discussion would be disadvantageous and agreed to make payments, albeit reluctantly. Moreover, that house went into foreclosure because the mortgage payments couldn't be met. Sarah grew tired of her father and seems to have found a live-in job and moved out. After hearing my final words, perhaps she took a hard look at herself because she left a letter addressed to me with the lawyer. In it, she wrote that she was hired as a live-in maid at a certain inn, and included words of apology to me. Even so, I haven't just let bygones be bygones, but in my heart I sent my daughter some silent support. Mike ended up filing for bankruptcy. Abandoned by his family and with nowhere to live, for a while, he was seen wrapped in cardboard, sleeping in parks and on riverbanks. Even in such straits, it seems he couldn't correct his reckless spending habits. He apparently got involved with loan sharks, and is now missing. It's no longer any of my business. On my end, I've been living a peaceful life while continuing with my job. Recently, I welcomed a new kitten into the family. It's a little charmer with folded ears, always snuggles up to me with a sweet look on its face. Today, when I sat on the couch, it climbed onto my lap and purred away. It was so endearing that it brought a smile to my face. I think to myself that I have to stay healthy for at least another 30 years, for this little one. That's how I spend my peaceful days.